Yes. This um, considering of the soul connection, it does require um, a few things. One of them being courage, really. Because especially, and I see who's asking, if you have been in a long-term relationship already for some time, um, we do tend to, even with all our best intentions, we do tend to build a whole lot of attachments and stories and things that then are very difficult to let go of. At the level of the soul, you are ready to give up everything now. The soul is ready to die now. It's not a problem. Because what? One, rela one um, experience of life ends and another one opens. Yes, sure, the ways of the relationship as they are now, they might end. But the relationship considered from the level of the soul, the soul connection that you truly really share with someone, it's forever. What? And then maybe you go two lives without each other and then boom, you meet again. Is even to a degree where you hope you could get rid of such a person that you're really connected with in the soul, you cannot. They will just show up again and again and you will learn another lesson together and another lesson together and another lesson together. And the ego which already builds so many attachments and stories and hopes for I don't know what life together, it will not enjoy this, um, this reality of uh, being thrown back into transformational um, experiences again and again. But the soul is very much up for it. So the way to figure out what is really coming from the soul and what is not is um, what would you do in your last hour? If this was your last hour, who is this person for you? You alone. You don't have to be in agreement about this. You can ask yourself, if this is my last hour, what is happening with this person? What is really essential? Who are they in my life? And sometimes, yeah, you might be shocked to find, you know what, if this was my last hour, I would not spend it with this person. I would rather sit and meditate alone than have this person on my neck. Okay, update, live with that. This might be something you find out. Or you might find, you know what, if this was my last hour, I would gladly spend it with this person. No matter if we would fight or if we would sit in silence or if we would make love, it doesn't matter. This is essential to me to feel them. It's essential to me to share myself with them. You might find that you feel quite detached about whether or not they are around, but that you love them in this or that way. Contemplate from this viewpoint that removes um, the whole idea of past and future. Because basically what happens within a relationship is that um, when you meet in the beginning and you fall in love and you have the grace of the beginning moment of really truly meeting the other one, your relationship is neither burdened by the past nor by the future. You are utterly simply open to whatever should happen to happen. And you're not so concerned, you're not thinking about, you're not confused, you're not, do I love them, don't I love them, I do love them, but how should it express itself, but this, but that, but that, that's all the mind. In that moment of grace of the beginning, when you really fall in love, it is clear, it is clear how you love this being, it is clear how you wish to express, because you are not burdened by the stories of the mind. You are not burdened by whatever kind of considerational stuff might rise later. Then, as the relationship continues, the main thing that you bulk up is a huge past. The longer the relationship becomes, the bigger the past that you build. And from that past, you start to build sandcastles for the future. And this is the problem. If you remove the attachments to the past, if you remove the idea of the past and you ask yourself, all right, completely free, without any knowledge of anything, if I woke up now, what is happening with this person? That is very likely to be quite real. That is very likely to be also what will bring you back again and again, however many times you need to play this beautiful game of love together. 
How to let go of attachment of stories of the past that still bring up ne negative feelings. Trying to move forward in relationships and focusing on what is working. But the stories still come up. I asked a question before about attachment and detachment and I am so grateful for your answer of balancing out the attachment and detachment and I have used that in many areas of my life but struggle when it comes to stories. I am attached to regarding my relationship. I feel like the answer is as simple as let it go but how to do so? Yeah, I mean, of course, let it go. That would be... Osho said it so nicely at one point, you cannot tell a stupid person to be intelligent. And this is how it is for many of these aspects that we understand very well intellectually, but then it is a difficulty to apply them. So um, one method that I personally find very, very helpful when it comes to uh, generally detaching feelings from stories is, uh, and I'm happily repeating myself, nonviolent communication. And then even the upgraded version of that, um, which is called compassionate communication. Within the processes of, of NVC, you learn to um, understand that there is a level inside of you which tells a story. And that level is usually coming also with all the judgments and the goods and the bads of that story and creating a perpetuation of certain feelings. For example, when you've been in a fight with someone, um, you will typically think throughout the day um, about how you could have come back that way and then they said that and that was not okay. And it's always about this back and forth of the story of what happened there. But seldomly do we sit down and just sit for a moment with the anger, which then might actually have underlying in it the sadness of feeling misunderstood and ha having underlying that a feeling of uh, being alone and feeling uh, in need and even in desperate need of human contact and so forth. So NBC very much focuses up on that to understand inside of you, okay, there is a layer of telling a story and putting judgment. And that has its place and we can just write that out or speak that out and then put it over here and put a pin in it. And then we can feel what is actually going on. And that feeling of what is actually happening inside of us is then typically revealing our deeper needs. And from those deeper needs, we can then place requests to ourselves and towards the outer world. So this is a very classic and simple process of, um, of NVC that you can find on YouTube and in courses in your city and uh, study it and learn it a bit. Once you go through this process of understanding what is judgment inside of you and what is feeling, um, very, very fast you get the hang of moving out of the story. Um, this is then deepened and compassionate communication, understanding that very often the stories that we do tend to tell to ourselves are stories that make us identify in a very specific way and they do typically stem from experiences from our early past, like when we were children. So um, that being said, actually stories that we are very attached to within our relationships are typically stories that we are attached to about ourselves. The other one is rather a scapegoat, a canvas that we can then project that story upon. May that be the story of you being the uh, poor little me, you being the triumphant one, you being the screwed over one, you being always the misunderstood one, you being the always angry one, you being the one always thought of as angry even though you are not, and whatever other stuff is going on. You will have that image inside of you from a very early age, and the other one has fairly little to do with that. Nevertheless, you use them as a canvas of projecting that idea of you on them. So compassionate communication helps with two very simple modalities to undo this, which is to assume um, on one hand self-compassion, meaning you accept everything you feel inside exactly the way it is. And even though it might be very difficult to, to tolerate it for now, you embrace that you are caught within your story. And then the other one being uh, self-responsibility where you assume fully and completely um, an inner understanding that the other one is not forcing you to feel this way, that you have been feeling this way for a long time. 
in many different situations where you re reveal that you are the common denominator of your suffering, not the other people. The people change. Suffering stays the same. How come? Oh, because it is my story. It is my thing. It is my inadequacy that I feel about myself. It is my uh, feeling of, uh, I don't know what, being narcissistic or being inferior or being this or being that. It is my story that remains the same. So um, play with that, operate with that. When you are ready to let go of stories within you, it will be a piece of cake to let go of stories in the outer world. Once you understand that you are reliving, reenacting something inside of you as a reminder of a past pain, as a reminder of some sort of experience that then you can sit with and maybe grieve through or embrace within your inner world and then have it completed and be done with it, that will then facilitate healing on all the levels of your being and your relationship will be very easily moving into a different, even just next level or next experience. How you know what is real and what is your imagination? This we were speaking about already a little bit. Just to say it in a nutshell, what is real remains, what is imagined dies. Check. You can wait, <laughs> you can challenge <laughs> and see what happens. Does the connection stay? It's real. Does it wither with some little motions of the wind? Not so real. I find that active love meditation helps to maintain or build a beautiful resonance between myself and my partner. However, I find that my capacity to emphasize uh, has greatly increased, uh, empathize, sorry, has greatly increased. I feel uh, a lot, but not just for my partner, but for people I never expected, for strangers, and it feels a bit overwhelming at times. I cry a lot. What does this mean? How do I bring this into my uh, in inquiry, especially who am I? Yeah, so very good uh, result of um, doing this uh, active love meditations and um, therefore building a wonderful resonance with your beloved. Um, yes, empathy does grow when your heart opens and um, with it, we notice also our, again, our attachments and trigger points inside. So what typically makes it um, difficult to empathize with others is then that we start to identify also with their suffering and we start to take that on and take that in. The um, way out is to learn um, to really deeply develop a sense of compassion, to be able to completely and fully feel someone, accept someone, and nevertheless not needing to um, indulge into their suffering. You can even become the other, but become them at a higher level where it is not necessary to suffer for what they are going through. Where you can acknowledge that they are suffering in that situation, but you are also aware, for example, of the deep meaning of the situation they are going through. So the more you start to identify um, within yourself with your soul and also see the other ones from a viewpoint of the soul, the, um, the less painful the, um, or let's say, painful is maybe not even the right word, but um, the less indulgent into the pain of the other you will be you will experience the pain of the world once you open yourself to the world, as you will experience the ecstasy of the world. This is a given. But then to suffer from that pain, that is optional. In order to learn to be empathetic while remaining detached, um, the thing that you can do is to develop what we call a, a superior receptivity which means that you learn to be, on one hand, very solar, radiant, outgoing, namely by awakening the young quality of your being, especially awakening the third chakra, the navel chakra, and also the third eye. 
And on the other hand, awakening the heart, opening your being, feeling other people. When you combine these, when you become radiant and solar and in the same time available to perceptions and available to the experiences of other people, then you develop what is called um, uh, superior receptivity, which will be um, giving you the option of experiencing something and letting it wash through you and that being it or then picking something that you might even want to resonate with because sometimes you might sit in the presence of a great saint and you perceive by empathy the purity of their soul and the grace alive inside of them and then maybe you wish to stay with that and to resonate with that but then you do that by choice not because somebody is forcing you to do so so this point you can take into consideration. More questions in the room? Um, active love. Um, what, what I'm doing, uh, because uh, me and Nicole are separated for, for a longer time now, and uh, what we are doing every day is uh, doing this love meditation, and we are using a music. Uh, what we used uh, in the school uh, before, but it seems it's uh, not the best um, because uh, she many times says that uh, um, always wandering the mind and uh, got some stories and uh, the mind is going that way so cannot focus uh, too much. So if you can uh, maybe give some suggestions for another music or doing without music or what else, what else options we can, we can uh, have and try. Okay. We use the Tony Ake music that uh, Shanzon mm -hmm. Poor Milan, if you remember. I do not. <laughs> yeah, some uh, music might tend to stimulate certain stories, certain aspects within, uh, within our inner world. But um, yeah, see if you can just try out some different options, some different musics and see if you find something that is less triggering than this. I can of course provide you something. And uh, it might be even helpful to meditate with um, uh, music of the godly attribute of godly love. Because like this you go to a very elevated level and it might make it easier for your mind to stop. In this case, um, it will be very good to practice some yoga and do meditations um, of focusing before you do the love meditation. So that you enter into the love meditation from a very focused place. And then another point is that if stories come up, they might be stories that need to be heard. It might be stories that need to be considered and talked about and looked into because they might still have a certain emotional charge or you know and that they might not even be related to the relationship but simply when one of you is uh, accessing the heart through music and meditation you might all of a sudden feel triggered by a completely other relationship with your family with your dog with I don't know who died or something so Take it into consideration that when the mind keeps being agitated on a very specific subject, whereas it is very quiet and sweet and beautiful when you meditate on something else, it might be necessary and meaningful to write down what is coming up and to deal with it, to look into it, to digest it together, to digest it alone. Maybe there needs to happen some forgiveness, maybe there needs to happen some clarification and then to to become quiet in this way. <laughs> and we have the last question. A question about celibacy. How to make the best of it? <laughs> what are the pits, pitfalls? I've gotten quite used to it and I'm wondering if I'm just drying up. Yes, it's a good thing to wonder. So, um, Celibacy, or um, as we would refer to it in the tantric con context, abstinence. Um, abstinence is something that most people enter because they don't have another choice. 
or because they are monks, one of the two. So either you go into a monastery, you make a vow and that's it, no more hanky-panky for you, or you just don't have somebody to do it with. And then um, in a new agey way, we tend to frame it as, oh, I've been in celibate for two years. No, you just haven't had sex. That's what happened to you. So in a tantric viewpoint, the non-activity uh, on the sexual level is called active abstinence. And that means, first of all, that your abstinence is a choice and that it is clear for how long you do it, if you do it forever, or if you're doing it for a few months or for a few years, whatever time frame you set. And that then you actively engage with the energies at that level through spiritual practice, uplifting them to higher levels so that you can use them. If you really, honestly, truly, fully want to become abstinent with everything that that entails, meaning that the energy that you are uh, holding within you becomes available inside of you, we are talking about a minimum of yoga practice, let's say, four or five hours per day. Otherwise, it can be easily compromised. It would mean that you also um, yourself from... Um, night pollutions and these sort of things and you uh, really use that energy inside of you to either become the most amazing yogi or uh, do wonderful creative work and write amazing poems and so forth but it would need to be with the seriosity of at least a few heavy hours of hatha yoga practice every day so that it actually becomes a meaningful practice and this way then the active abstinence would match up with uh, the other side of the tantric practice, which is continence, which means you do engage erotically, but you um, abstain yourself from ejaculation and uh, uncontrolled orgasms and have rather inward orgasms that implode within your inner universe and give very uplifting and ecstatic states. So the abstinence should come to that degree of uh, commitment like you would remain making love, like you really consider that energy inside of you fully as a, a very alive potential inside of you that then you choose to alchemize to other levels of your being. So if you do feel that you are drying up, <clears throat> it definitely means that that energy is not actively engaged inside of you and can then not be used for uh, something wonderful. In that case, quite often, just holding abstinence because it happens can then lead to yeah, either just becoming dry or eventually even having uh, maybe some ailments, sicknesses at the erotic level, at the sexual level, um, yeah, which simply show that it is not really integrated and harmonized within your being. So an, an actively abstinent person would be as uh, awakened and... Um, even to a degree erotic with the, in the connection with the world around. I mean, just the state of enlightenment is in itself such an erotic state of being utterly open and merged with the world around you. So an actively abstinent person would have that same degree of eroticism and openness and engagement um, with the world as an erotically active person would have. But with such a strength of... Uh, uh, sublimation of alchemy inside that allows you to um, actually have that energy come out at the most elevated levels of your being. It's a relative choice. I'm holding out, out for a special kind of love. So yeah, last uh, remark to this abstinence story. Um, if you are um, sort of saving yourself for an, an amazing, beautiful manifestation of love, then also choose to do that actively. And it can even become a practice that helps you prepare yourself and even helps you find and manifest that type of love within your life. So make it a clear choice and take it a few months at the time. You're like, all right, for the next six months, abstinence, full on practice. What am I doing with my erotic energies? How do I still need to harmonize them? And so forth. So not just cutting that off, especially if you are waiting for love to manifest within your life. Stay very engaged with that energy, but in the same time, 
alchemize it, sublime it into higher and higher forms of energy. If this is something that interests you more, come to the ongoing uh, yoga and tantra courses and there you will learn in depth how to do this entire process. So sweethearts, that being said, we are completing our session here. I hope to see you soon. Maybe I can once more see you and your beautiful faces on the camera if you feel. And we can wave at each other. Hey guys, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content on spirituality, tantra and more. And if you want to sign up for our online classes or for our retreats, you can see our website on the description below.